Before we start our discussion on equations of state, I think it's really important for you to understand what an ideal gas is, where does this concept come from, and you know what's a real gas. I, you know the word ideal it kind of signals to you um, that you can't reach that state. You know, no one's an ideal person. Um, the word ideal means it can also be said as a perfect gas. So you know um, you can never be perfect. <laughs> So, you know, gases can never really be perfect, it can be very close and we can approximate to it to be an ideal or a perfect gas, um, but, you know, that's only under a very strict range of conditions um, that our gas will be ideal, that it will show this sort of ideal behavior. Um, aside from those very restricted range of values of triad, temperature and pressure, your gas outside of those values, your gas is going to behave like a real gas. Um, so anyways, we'll talk about the difference in a second. First, let's see an ideal gas. An ideal gas, um, it, it comes, it builds on from, the, um, from you know, some points from the kinetic theory of molecules. So we'll just brush over it very, very, very quickly, and I'll descri describe this in detail in another video um, because it really does require justification, um, you know, over one one video. It requires two, three videos of its own. It's a very important topic. But essentially, the main assumptions of an ideal gas is, is that the volume of gas is negligible compared to volume of container. So you're kind of approximating that your volume, you know, it, it's, it's almost, the volume of the gas is almost zero. So you're approximating in the ideal gas, you're saying it is zero. Um, you know, you could be like, oh, how did that, does it make sense? Well, think about it. Look at the room around you and imagine a, a tiny little gas atom you know, floating around in space, you see that, you know, if you could imagine it shrinking to the size of an atom, you see that's very, 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 very small compared to the overall size of the room. So the volume of that little, little sphere is much smaller than the volume of the room, so it can be neglected, okay? So that's one assumption. The second assumption is that there's no interaction between the particles, okay, between the gas molecules. So what that means is that, um, you know, in your volume, gases occupy, um, the molecules aren't, they're never so close that they interact with each other. We, we we're going to pretend that if you were molecules, okay, pretend yourself to be a molecule, and you were in a huge room, let's say this room is the size of Antarctica, and let's say we put 5,000 people in, in, in that little room in different various positions. Well, or actually let's scale that down to the size of the Milky Way. Let's say you have the Milky Way galaxy and you add 5,000 people to it in various positions. Well, no matter how much those people wander, it's, the probability of them meeting is it's negligible, right? It's, it's the size of the Milky Way is so huge that the chances of these 5,000 people ever crossing paths, um, it, it seems pretty negligible, okay? So that's the rationale behind why there's no interaction between these gas molecules because they're so small compared to the size of the container that they're in. So with these two powerful assumptions, we can state that we have an ideal gas. So this is a gas that um, satisfies both of these assumptions. And the equation of state, so how do you describe the state of this ideal gas? It's given by the ideal gas law, PV is equal to nRT. So if you know if you know any three of these quantities, you know exactly everything you need to know about this idea of gas. Um, again, I might rewrite this as P V over N is equal to R T. And remember, I told you that uh, we will we will turn our extensive properties into intensive properties and. Here we go, here's an example, and you'll see it written um, in many forms. 
you know, I could I could write it as PV with that little sign on the head. So just note that it doesn't really matter what what the sign, what how it looks like. You should know the idea behind it. So equation of state. We've nailed down the equation of state for an ideal gas. PV is equal to nRT. But gases are not ideal in real life. In the conditions around us, gases don't take ideal behavior. They take real gas behavior. Um, so these gases are gases whose volume is not negligible, and there is interactions between the gas molecules. So for example, let's say you increase the pressure of the container large enough. So let's say in our Milky Way example, um, we have, let's say, um, 10 to the power 100 people who I drop around in the Milky Way. Now there's such a high concentration of people there that interactions are bound to happen, right? So the pressure is increasing because um, if, if you imagine a magical boundary um, that that encompasses encompasses the Milky Way, let's say it's made out of glass, and then let's say these people are in random motion. Let's say they're just they're just going in random directions, they're sleeping. So they're just drifting off in random directions. At a certain point, they'll hit that imaginary wall, and let's say it's made out of glass. So you, you know, you'll have many collisions, and that will produce some sort of pressure onto your system. Okay, so so then you know pressure um, you can neglect interactions between molecules, um, and because of that, you'll see there's going to be some change to this pressure value, and because you can neglect volume, there's going to be some change to this volume value in for a real gas. So now let's go look at some equations of state. One is the compressibility factor, equation of state, and that's really Z. Um, how do we define this variable um, Z? It's that it's the ratio of the volume of the real gas to the ideal gas. So if Z is equal to 1, that means, you know, V real is equal to V ideal. And I have this little sign on the head to denote that it is molar volume. Okay, if these two quantities are the same, then they cancel out and Z gets equal to 1. When Z is equal to 1, you have an ideal gas. Okay, so I could rewrite this as PV is equal to, let's say PV bar is equal to Z or T, right? Because you could, so where did I randomly get the Z from, you could ask? Well, here's where I got it from. For an ideal gas, PV is equal to NRT, okay? So that Z is still there, but that Z is equal to 1, so we don't write it, we just write PV is equal to NRT. For a real gas, you'll see that Z is not going to be equal to 1 for a real gas. And so then you're going to have to solve that equation by using PV is equal to ZRT. Um, that will that'll kind of fix the values of pressure and volume for this system. So you can see that if, you know, ask yourself uh, what's happening to the volume of the real gas if z is less than 1, z is greater than 1. So if z is greater than 1, right, that means this number on top is bigger than the number on the bottom. For example, 100 divided by 10. You're always going to, if the number on the top is bigger than the number on the bottom, you're always going to get um, an answer greater than 1. So that means the volume of the real gas is actually more than what the ideal gas law would predict. That's what z tells us. Okay, moving on to virial expansion or virial, virial equation of state. This is a very powerful um, equation of state. It's used many times. So really what this equation of state does is it's um, PV real, so over RT. It takes our compressibility equation, you know, PV real over RT that we just found from here with the compressibility factor, and it expands it as a Taylor series. So how does it expand? Well, it says that, you know, it's for, for an ideal gas, the value is 1. But for a real gas, you have to make some adjustments. And those adjustments are by adding some constants, B, C, you know, D, and so on. But not only that, you have to divide by the molar volume. So in this condition, it's V squared. In this condition, it's also, you know, it's... Uh, it could be v squared, 
um, and so on. So that's how, that's how you expand a Taylor series. If you know how to expand it, then you'll be you'll be able to figure out this equation of state. Um, all of these constants are dependent on temperature. Okay, so the Virial equation of state is useful in that it helps us find out what we need to know um, with the help of these with these Virial coefficients, as we can call them. Okay. So let's just do a little, let's just talk about this a little bit more. So usually CT over V squared, actually, sorry, this is V cubed, this is V to the power of 4, so on. Um, v, v cubed, it's actually very, very small. You know, it's, so this is smaller than, this is smaller than this, or b over t over v squared is larger than this term. And you know, it, the, it's so large that you could basically um, truncate or end the series um, after the second virial coefficient. And that's what you'll see in most, most examples you'll be doing. That really, the virial equation of state simplifies into this. Um, so, anyways, um, how you expand the Taylor, Taylor series, you can look that up. I think I might have done a mistake somewhere. But the important part to notice is that you are only concerned about the first two terms of the series. The rest of the terms are so small, it doesn't matter. Like, you could go 1 plus 0 0.0000001. You know, it, it doesn't really change the value of 1. Um, so now, I want to stress... Um, that this is an equation that's important. So let's do this. Let's let's do some sort of example. If you were to go ahead and let's say you plot it, so you go ahead and you plot. 1 over v squared, the molar mass squared, and you plot it as a function of z, you would see that you have a straight line okay so you would have a straight line and the slope would be your second virial coefficient v of t. Well how do I get this? How did I get this? It's simple, I got it from here. So as we know, for a straight line, the equation is y is equal to mx plus b, where the m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Basically, where do you intercept on the y-axis? You intercept at 1 in this case. Our x is the independent variable, which we can, you know, we could rewrite this as b over t times 1 over v squared, which this part is our x. This part is our b, so that leaves b over t as being our slope m. So this is how you can calculate the virial coefficient if you need to.